have to respect each other enough to stop yelling at each other and start listening and quit intimidating each other through either our role or whatever means that we decide to use. Unfortunately, this has not happened, and that is why I stand before you today, and I take full responsibility for this frustration, and I take full responsibility for the inaction that has occurred. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard. It's time for the Molesburg panel, and I believe that what we witnessed today is a watershed moment. It is a disgrace. And, you know, as, as the father of someone who's uh, starting next year to think about looking to colleges, a sophomore in high school, my son is a sophomore in high school, do I even want to send him to a university anymore? There's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom of thought, and now you have the president of the University of Missouri quitting under pressure because some rabble people, you know, protesting hunger strike, and because it spread to the football team, and the football team threatened not to play, and they make tens of millions of dollars off that football team, this man had to resign, and what did he do? Nothing! Joining us now on the panel is Larry Elder, radio host of The Larry Elder Show, and David Swerdlick, assistant editor of Post Everything at The Washington Post. All right, David, why did Tim Wolf have to resign? What did he do that, that was racist? What did he say that was racist? What's going on on that campus that's so racist? I want to know. Well, Steve, to me, where we are in this story, it's not that Tim Wolf had to resign. It's that I think we probably got here and a decision was made somehow behind closed doors that he was going to resign because he wasn't proactive in dealing with the situation that was bubbling up on campus. And if, if you're against him resigning, I have no problem with that. But clearly, the football players figured out that they had some leverage here. And when their coach backed them and the athletic department backed them, the situation got a lot hotter for President Wolf at the school. And so, you know, I mean, leverage was applied, whether you agree with the underlying reasons or not. Larry, uh, all right, what's the problem on campus that's bubbling over? Well, David said uh, there was pressure whether you agree with the underlying reasons or not. Let's talk about the underlying reasons. Sure. What were they? Apparently, there was a swastika that was drawn, uh, and somebody drove by in a truck and shot out the end. Wait, a swastika was drawn with human beings. Wait, 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 Larry, Larry, Larry. I mean, David, let Larry finish. Then don't you go. Go ahead. Ergo, our campus is roiled with racism. The president said, ordered there to be diversity training for the staff, for the faculty, and for students. And one of the demands was that he acknowledge his white male privilege. I mean, my goodness, what does that even mean? What specifically was he supposed to have done about somebody who drew a swastika other than investigate and find out who the hell did it and kick the person out assuming it was a student? David? What else was he supposed to do? David? Okay, well, look, again, this is not a story I have reported on, but my understanding based <laughs> on what's been reported widely is that there was the swastika and feces. Uh, uh, the student body president reported out on his own Facebook page that he had been called the N-word on a public street in Columbia. There were some other incidents that were reported out about students being, uh, you know, called the N-word publicly at protests. At, at whether or not that rises to the level of the Tim Wolf administration of Mizzou has to crumble, I do think, based on what I've seen, that he didn't seem proactively to be dealing with this in a way that he could bring students on all sides of the issue together. And David, David, what would yeah. you suggest? Give me an example of being proactive. First of all, I seem to remember was at Columbia University. Uh, this black professor said they put a, a, a noose, noose. Uh, and, and turned it. Didn't it turn out she she yeah. put the noose up? She so herself. so yeah. so the swastika until right. they find out that it was a white person who did it aimed at black people. I, that's not even an issue right now. So tell let, me how you would have been proactive, David. Let, let me let me be clear, Steve. I am neither call, I wasn't calling for Tim Wolf's resignation, and I'm not now saying that that had to be the case. I'm saying that whatever else w you think about either side of this issue, the football players along with camp campus activists clearly felt like the campus climate was not what they wanted to see and they used the leverage they had. I know that it strikes some people as this idea of the students turning the tables on the grown-ups, but 
you, that is the inherent problem, as you yourself pointed out at the top, right? That the, the student athletes in the revenue sports, football and basketball, generate millions of dollars for the school, and if they sort of rise up as one and say, we want change, who knows what was said behind the scenes to the president? Right, no, Larry, it's, if, if the, if, it's all about the sports. Because how, is they, how are they going to recruit? How are they going to do anything? How are they going to get black players if they're black players? You know what I would have done? I mean, if, if I had the leeway and money wasn't the main issue, which it is, I would have said, you don't play next week? You lose your scholarships. Get the heck off campus. I mean, you know, they're, being, they're there under scholarships <laughs> to play football. You don't play football in protest. You go home. Well, I'd like to see the, the president uh, who has cashews to do that. Uh, but David is right. So much pressure was brought to bear on this guy because of the football team. They were going to lose a million dollars if they hadn't played BYU this right. coming uh, Saturday. Uh, and nobody could withstand that kind of pressure. But one of the demands is to hire more faculty uh, and to recruit more minority students. Yep. No matter how qualified they are, yep. no, matter, no matter whether or not they can do the work, the more you lower standards to recruit uh, minority students, the higher the dropout rate is. So what kind of favor are you doing by urging the the uh, university to hire faculty who are not qualified necessarily or to hire students that can't do the job. As you it's ridiculous. And, and, and as yep. you mentioned, maybe they should demand all the teachers that are white uh, proclaim that they're, they, they have white privilege. But, I no, mean, wait, no, wait, look. David, but, 10 seconds. Go ahead. The one thing I'll push back on, Larry, is I don't think a demand for more diversity is a demand for lowering standards. It's all just right, a demand right. for we'll, we'll diversity. We'll debate that later. All right, guys, 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 remember to tune in tomorrow, everybody, 11 p.m. Eastern for Newsmax TV special GOP debate coverage, post-GOP debate coverage. Dick Morris, Michael Savage, John Zogby, and many more will be joining us for political analysis. That's tomorrow night, 11 p.m. Eastern, only on Newsmax TV. quickly ask you about this Ben Carson stuff because you have seen some people leak out stuff you wrote 30 and 40 years ago. Is this fair game? No. I think it might be a better idea. I know it's a crazy idea, but maybe we focus on the issues impacting the American people and what candidates are saying rather than just spending so much time exploring their lives of 30 or 40 years ago. And I think the reason that so many people are turned off to the political process has a lot to do with the fact that we're not talking about the real issues impacting real people. Now, was that Larry David or was that actually Bernie Sanders? That's the question. All right, uh, folks. Uh, uh, by the way, if, you know, uh, interesting. Notice that, notice that um, Chuck Todd didn't dare say what he wrote 40 years ago. He wouldn't dare name it. Just that you wrote something 40 years ago. Yeah, that women fantasize about being raped by three men at the same time when they're having sex with their partner. Uh, I mean, you know, that's, that's why he didn't bring it up. Rejoining us on the panel, David Swerdlick and Larry Elder. Larry, let me start with you this time. Um, the whole, the whole bit, first of all, kudos to what you did on CNN over the weekend on the Schmacanas show. You were fantastic. Uh, your take on, on this. And by the way, I should add, an old college, uh, an old colleague, an old colleague, is now defending Ben Carson, said he told him about the stabbing story before he was famous. And, and uh, Carson's mother uh, also, in 1997, uh, was interviewed, and she talked about the stabbing story, how he would have stabbed this kid in the stomach or chest, except that the belt saved the kid. This was in 97. So right. this isn't something that, that, that he made up and nobody knew about. Well, in general, if you decide to run for public office and, God forbid, you start leading the pack, if you picked your toes in Poughkeepsie, it's going to be fair game. I have no problem whatsoever with the scrutiny about Ben Carson's background. All I ask for, as I said on the Shmurkana show, is for fairness. Obama got a pass for months and months uh, when Fox News was talking about the Reverend Jeremiah Wright connection. Uh, and Obama told this story over and over again about his mom lay dying in a hospital bed uh, as she fought with her insurance carriers over the payment of her hospital and medical bills. Turns out it is not true. Now, those stories did not kill his candidacy any more than the 
need discrepancy should kill Ben Carson. I just want them to put the same amount of intensity and put the same amount of time and effort into disproving stories made by Democrats as they do stories made by Republicans. That's right. all David, I ask. David, you got Hillary running under sniper fire until the video showed she was a, that was a bald-faced lie. Right. Hillary being named after Sir Edmund uh, Hillary because he climbed <laughs> Mount Everest. Right. Of course, so she was born before he cl right. uh, climbed Mount Everest. And the list goes on and on. Joe Biden, plagiarist. Never talked about that when and, he was and Joe Biden. This uh, uh, Steve said he was a coal president. miner. Never set foot in a coal. coal right, mine. right. That too. Okay, go ahead, David. Uh, look, I'm glad you brought uh, Secretary Clinton back up because we talked about this on the show on Friday, right? And I think there's a parallel between Clinton and Carson. The the email scandal with Clinton is fair game. It's been talked about. It'll continue to be talked about. Clearly, emails came out in that hearing that showed that she had said one thing in private and one thing in public, voters will decide if that's disqualifying. Like Carson. Carson, like Larry said, some of these stories have, have been oversold as fabrications when they're really more like embellishments, but they're all out there and the voters will decide if that's disqualifying. I think the key is, just like with President Obama, all this information was out when people were running for president, and it's for the voters to decide. I don't think there's an issue with media bias. My criticism of, of, of Dr. Carson is that he has complained about this too much. You're running for president. This is part of running for president. If you go to his website, Steve and Larry, there's very, very little about policy. And in debates, he said very little about policy. So people are going to talk about what's in his 11 or 12 books. All right, guys, I, 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 want, I want to throw Hillary into the mix. Did she make a Freudian slip here? You know, the president has said he wants to get, ban the box on federal right. job applications right. where you check the box off uh, if you uh, were a convicted felon. So Hillary now says she wants to ban the box. Listen. Every year, hundreds of thousands of prisoners re-enter society. That's the good news. They've paid their debt. They're free. But then what happens? They look for a job. Everywhere they go, doors are shut in their faces. That starts all over again, a cycle of poverty and hopelessness that too often can lead to more crime. All right, that's the wrong one. But she went on to say that that presidents uh, have to check the box if they if they're criminals. And yeah. I, I thought I was playing that bite, but nonetheless, she still said it. And and it was a terrible, I think, terrible Freudian slip, Larry. Yeah, she said former presidents, when they apply for jobs, have to check the box. Yeah. Uh, as as former as former Governor Rick Perry famously put it, whoops. Yeah. Real quickly about what David said, this quickly, is not about media bias. It most certainly is about media bias. Deborah Howell is the ombudsperson for the Washington Post. She wrote two articles in which she said that my paper was biased in favor of Obama okay. over McCain in 2008 okay. David, on the front page. David, More stories about uh, Obama than McCain. David, gotta go to David. Ten seconds. Uh, that was before my time at the Post, so I'm going to defer on that one. But I don't <laughs> think, I don't, no, no, seriously, That's, but I don't think Carson is facing media bias. He's just facing scrutiny of running right, for guys, president. Did you see what happened on the Bill O'Reilly show? Watch next.